Out of the darkness and into the light Strong are the people, the future is bright We are together, together we stand Our children, our future for women and men Young and proud in West Africa Lucky to live in Liberia Care for our children, care for our land We are together, together we stand Liberia Right, uh, once again, uh, we want to say welcome. Welcome to another segment of my time here. Uh, Alright, trying to set things right. Let's see how it goes here. I think I can get an indication that it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's okay. Uh, also, you can give us your feedback. If you're not getting us uh, laudable enough, uh, give us your feedback as well. We highly appreciate so we can do some adjust uh, adjustment. Okay. Uh, thanks for joining in um, our second segment here on uh, on today's uh, views and uh, and analysis of, of issues that are uh, that, you know that we all have a part to you know to 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 play and also to make contribution of. Right now um, we are shifting to something different, as you can see the caption there uh, on what we talk what we will be talking about. Uh, uh, but we will profile a story um, here, um, which was published uh, two days ago by Front Page Africa. It has to do with uh, uh, health and, of course, uh, traditional traditional beliefs or traditional male wife issue. But uh, to talk on 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 this matter, uh, I have with me. Uh, um let me see i think it's better to hear from the house's home say mouth instead of me calling his name because he's right here if it was going to be far away fine but i have with me uh mr well my name my name is fidel buddy i'm uh secretary general of the union of liberian organizations in the uk i am also uh, a writer so i write for the international journal uh, of maternal and child health and aids uh, based in the u.s uh, and I've, I've actually had an article published on health systems in Liberia uh, in 2015. And I am a Liberian uh, and I'm also doing my, my PhD at the moment at Aberystwyth University, looking at how uh, rural communities are affected by uh, globalization. Well, Fidel, uh, Mr. Budi, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to have you on, um, <laughs> and not specifically uh, in this studio, but uh, uh, it came for a very, very important uh, event. Uh, I want to see, I want to use this medium as well, international medium, to say thank you so much for uh, coming in and for also joining in. And welcome to all of you that are tuning in right now, especially uh, via Facebook. Um, we do apologize. Um, uh, the UK studio of Radio LRV stayed down due to some technical problem. So um, this broadcast is uh, done through uh, uh, this uh, channel, my own channel. Of course, uh, it will be uploaded as well on uh, on my channels right out of uh, YouTube. But uh, let's go to straight to the matter. Uh, we we want to talk a little bit about you know health health system, whether it has to be in general or in a specific context. Uh, where we we'll be microscoping uh, traditional midwives, uh, you know, in connection uh, to the story that was reported uh, two days ago by Front Page Africa, which of course uh, I will take my time to read the story to you. Uh, we will talk. We will, we will, we will try to highlight some of the important uh, thing, uh, important things that have been flagged out there, and we will discuss it. Uh, if, if there's any uh, perhaps um, advice that we can also pass on to the authority, whether it's the Ministry of Health, whether it would be uh, for NGOs on the ground or to the midwives also, you know, 
uh, it will go to them. Uh, but I just also want to encourage all of you, or oh, please, uh, uh, please do share the video. Uh, those of you that are watching us live right now, please, uh, please do share the video so at least uh, we can have people tune in as well uh, to to watch this particular broadcast. I think I did um, not the right one. Let me see. Um, okay, uh, thanks to uh, some of you that already started sharing the video as well, inviting people. Uh, let's see whether we can uh, uh, add more people on this particular uh, subject. But uh, we want to also encourage you that um, why we kick the ball rolling on this particular topic, uh, if, whether it would be from the newspaper story we'll be reading or not. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have any contribution, you can uh, you can just jot it down there. Those of you that are watching live, and uh, we'll be able to read it uh, uh, and share your thoughts as well to the rest of the librarian community and, of course, our friends of Liberia. Uh, so welcome once again. Let me go strictly to the story. Uh, it was reported two days ago. Let me take the caption. The caption says here, how traditional beliefs contribute to maternal mortality in rural Liberia. That is the caption. Uh, let's see whether we can get the body of the story right now. Okay, this is here, Riverside County, Riverside County. In extreme labor, which had been ongoing for two days, Mata Gawe had to leave her village, Claire Bay, to pillar of, to pillar of fire mission in Yani District via canoe on the Yani River, a journey that took her little over an hour. I just remember that she was pregnant already, being a void of options. Her husband could not leave his wife in that previous condition, or precarious condition rather. He hired able-bodied men to carry her in a hammock to the river banks to con commence her journey into Yani, where the only clinic in the district is located on the premises of the Pillar of Fire Mission. Okay, let's see. According to the husband, Joseph Gawe, Mata had been in labor two days earlier. She was first taken to traditional midwife in the, in the area. But the midwife, he said, could not help deliver the baby. Mata had some complications. The midwife ha uh, backed up the delivery superstitiously, accusing Mata of committing adultery for which she was suffering complications and have prolonged labor. I hope you, you guys are following the story. Uh, if you have any comment, you can jot it down as well. Resolving to, dis, to, to take his wife to the clinic, which is distance away across the river, be, uh, became the last resort for Joseph. He, the, but canoes do not come by easily. He had to wait with his wife, who was already in labor for the return of the canoe from across the river. Alas, Mata did not end the journey alive, and was, and so was the baby. She is among hundreds of women in rural Liberia who sometimes die narrowly, survive, some, sometimes die or narrowly survive delivery based on the mistaken beliefs of many untrained traditional midwives, RTM or TTM, a traditional birth attendance, TBA, who believe no. labor complication is a result of adultery. Fidel, you follow the story, eh? I, I am. Very, I, very hard touching. Yeah. The situation of matter is just a small portion, a small part of story in Liberia, where basic health care delivery services in many rural villages remain a challenge. Women in these areas are forced to rely on untrained traditional male wives to do their deliveries, and the deplorable conditions of roads in rural Liberia compounds the, the challenge. This is, this is one of several reasons why maternal mortality has been high in Liberia. In 2012, the United Nations Children's Fund reported that Liberia had 990 maternal deaths per 100,000 life births. 34 Neonatal deaths, neonatal deaths by 
thousand life waves and a lifetime risk of antenna death of one in twenty. The corresponding values reported in twenty. 14 were similar 990 maintainer deaths by 100,000 life deaths 27 new nitro deaths by 100 by 1000 life deaths and a lifetime risk of maternal maternal death of 1 in 24 as the villagers witness the sad event of Galway family unfolding before them their eyes uh, let me see. Uh, sorry for the distraction. As I want to read uh, why you or people that are joining us were at the same time. Let me go back to that. As the, as the villagers witness the sad event of the, of the Galway family unfolding before them, their eyes. Sarah Jacobs, a lady who stood with tears in her eyes, began to explain her own similar and painful experience during the civil crisis in Liberia when she gave birth to her first son in Grand Basel County. That midwife accused me of having an affair with a different man and not my husband. So I should confess my lover's name. And as I bled, she beat my legs. Finally, I just pulled a name from the air and gave it to her, says Sarah in a weeping voice. She further explained that in an adjacent room, a man knocked some of uh, some old cops together and said he was consulting the gods of their ancestors who would allow her to live because she had confessed the name of her lover. I had to lie to the midwife because I was bleeding too much and getting weak. After that, midwife gave me some some of kerosene to drink because she believed it would help bring down the at the afterbirth and I passed out before I had the chance to hold my first child when the afterbirth came out, Sarah explained. However, the maternal mortality situation in Liberia is beginning to improve as the government of Liberia over the years has trained over 8,020 8, traditional male wives TTM, to improve their delivery skills. In addition, they learn to offer basic uh, prenatal care to recognize early danger signs in, in pregnant women and transfer them to medical clinics before complicated labor begins. TTMs are an in integral part of the country's strate strategy for reducing maternal deaths, which is uh, supported by international donors. According to the Ministry of Health report, the proportion of deliveries attended by skilled personnel has increased from 46.3% in 2009 uh, nine to 64.7% in 2010. And over the past two years, Liberia has made significant progress towards improving maternal and child health by steadily reducing home-based delivery. Analysis of data on birth attended by skilled health workers indicate a decline of 26.3% from 1986 to 2010. In addition, the Liberia Demographic and Health Survey in, 27, in 2007 shows that almost 8 in 10 mothers, 79% receive prenatal care from a healthcare professional, doctor, nurse, midwife, or physician assistant, while 16% of mothers receive prenatal care be from a traditional midwife, and 4% of mothers do not receive any prenatal care. So there's still a big problem there. Uh, Marta, Marta Abraham, 43 years old, is a, tra is a trained traditional midwife who lives in Tudi district in rural Mosrado. She was she once confirmed in a in an interview that a similar situation of Mata's case happened in her district before their training. In some of the villages there is no car road, she said. So people thought carry the pregnant woman in a hammock 
to reach a clinic in time to deliver. But sometimes they can die when the midwife who did not go under the training wastes time to bring them to the clinic soon, she said. However, the reduction in maternal deaths, according to the recent WHO, that's the World Health Organization Maternal Mortality Survey, post Liberia at 770 maternal deaths to every 100,000 live births. This recent survey raised Liberia at the eighth place among countries with the highest maternal mortality rate in the world, with South Sudan topping the chart with 2,054 maternal deaths. South Sudan is followed by Chad, who has 1,100 maternal deaths, Somalia, 1,000 maternal deaths, Sierra Leone, 890 maternal deaths, Central African Republic, 890 maternal deaths, Burundi, 800 maternal deaths, and Guinea Bissau, 790 maternal deaths. Even though Sierra survived, but other women, but other young women like Mata are not so lucky today as they need for more trained traditional midwives to be deployed in difficult or hard to reach areas in many rural villages remains a tough challenge. And finally for this story it says here and as the lack of rules and bridges and bridges remain an obstacle in preventing pregnant women of getting proper health care, the fight of maternal mortality remains a huge challenge in time to come. I see a couple of librarians as usual, uh, when the story comes up on the uh, front page Africa, uh, we see librarians reacting after reading uh, uh, the article also. Uh, this is it, uh, Fidel. Um, first of all, I mean, yeah, what do you make of the story? Uh, you know, as a father, as a man, this is, this is really disturbing. Well, I think, uh, f thank you uh, for having me, Max. Uh, I think, first of all, we have to realize that, you know, first the first thing I want to do is to say to the writer mm -hmm. that, you know, the story is well balanced in terms of the, the issues. Yeah. But then also bringing up uh, comments about the statistics and how things have improved. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, the information that we're playing around with here, yeah. uh, mostly from 2007, 2009, 2010, we're in 2017. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think what would have been more appropriate was to try and use some of the data from the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. more 2015, 16, and, and closer to the time. Because, uh, you know, the uh, increase in the trained health workers was from the 2010 report. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's seven years ago. So we don't know how bad it is now. The second thing I'd like to raise as well is... And Mata just died. To, uh, I, I know, I know. The second thing I'd like to raise as well is the fact that we, a lot of us outside of Liberia in the diaspora saw the devastation yeah. and the exposure of the inadequacy of our health system that Ebola brought on. Uh, the Ebola crisis opened a lot of people's eyes to the fact that the health system and my my article actually came just post uh, Ebola which is in 2015 right. drawing on some of the uh, difficulties that we had in the Ebola crisis but the Ebola crisis was very bad for Liberia but good in some cases because it opened the rest of the world to see that look we've been pouring a lot of money into Liberia we've been investing in the healthcare delivery system in Liberia not just through the government but through NGOs and through civil society organizations and unfortunately, mm -hmm. nothing significant had happened. Yeah. And that is something we need to consider as well. So just, you know, while we're discussing the uh, the article, we need to try and look at the fact that now we have a bigger understanding of what the problems are in Liberia in terms of how backward and how uh, unready uh, or how under... Uh, 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 facilitated mm -hmm. our, 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 our health system is. And I think that's where we need to start from in terms of, because, you know, they talked about 8,000 healthcare workers, mm -hmm. but where are those 8,000 healthcare workers? And then it brings us to the question of decentralization. Do we have these people living in these communities? Because from that story, from the story of Mata, yeah. uh, she went to a traditional midwife, not to a health, a trained healthcare worker. Yeah. And we, as much as I appreciate and respect the Liberian tradition, there, some, there are things that are biological, there are things that are medical, there are things that are chemical 
or uh, something they're, they're mathematical that they might not be able to deal with in yeah. terms of how many seconds between uh, contractions that you need to be more aware of doing certain things. Mm-hmm. You know, so those kind of things, we can't leave them to traditional health uh, midwives. And and those are some of the things that we need to underpin, you know, when we talked about it. But in terms of the article itself, I think it's well, well written. Yeah. It brings up a very good point. And I think it's something that we can definitely dive into and have more uh, conversations. Let, let, let's see whether we can, uh, let's see from, we can start from point to point. Um, uh, because uh, the the story here is macroscoping uh, traditional midwives mm-hmm. and the beliefs as well that comes with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then uh, the practice, their practice, and of course the beliefs they have, is also affecting the life of people that are get, that are pregnant. Mm-hmm. And uh, if the the life of pregnant women, I you know, are in question under such a condition, uh, Fidel. I mean, do you think something wrong somewhere that perhaps something needs to be done? Or let's say, well, is your traditional belief? Let's just leave them and continue to do what, how they do it. Where do we stand, especially on this story? Because well, the thing how, is- can you, how can you uh, say that uh, somebody, a pregnant woman is having the uh, complications only because they have cheated on their husband. Does that hold? It's, 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 it's an unfortunate situation. I think it's for you and I, uh, and for a lot of librarians, uh, we, we have the privilege of uh, having a formal education. Uh, and we know that you don't uh, identify if someone's uh, cheated on their partner. Uh, because of the complications that they have at birth, yeah, you yeah. know, obviously we 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 understand that, but we're privileged to have that kind of level of understanding in terms of the education that we've we've attained. Yeah, I believe. Look, I I I am a huge believer in our culture and our traditions. I think they are important. I think they were significant in some of our lives when we were growing up as kids. It puts in place a structure of discipline. Uh, in rural communities and even in urban societies, you know, because of the chain of command, dad mm-hmm. is the head of the home, yeah. and, you know, moms take care of uh, certain things and kids have to do certain things. So that mm-hmm. tradition and that culture, you know, there's parts of it that we need to keep. However, mm-hmm. when it comes to issues like maternal mortality or where a woman's life has been put at risk or, well, she was, you know, she died because of the fact that she didn't have uh, the right yeah. level of treatment. Yeah. That comes down to responsibility. Uh, in this case, uh, it is the responsibility primarily of the Liberian government uh, to make sure that information about... Well, the Liberian government was not there, though. They didn't know anything what uh, matter they, was... They should, they should be there. You know, like, you know, every, you know, every, uh, every district in Liberia should have uh, individuals mm-hmm. who can attend to... Uh, uh, People like matter uh, who you know if they're in 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 labor and they need someone, so they need someone within the community that can attend to them. That is the responsibility, primary responsibility of a government. Every social uh, uh, social uh, uh, activity or every social uh, construction or every everything that has to do with promoting society, anything that has to do with making sure that uh, aspects of the society function in a certain way mm-hmm. has to be the responsibility of the government. That's why people pay taxes and that's why uh, donor governments give money into the Liberian government for these kind of things. So obviously it is primarily the responsibility of the government to make sure that matter had access to one, get to a clinic, yeah. but two, once she's gotten to a clinic, to have someone there who's trained to know that you don't tell what a woman is uh, has cheated on her husband by the number of contractions she's had or how difficult her mm, labor yeah. is. That's 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 particular math doesn't hold. So obviously, I mean, there, there's something lacking there because uh, I mean, first of all, uh, Maita didn't start a journey by strictly going to the uh, to the uh, to the morning clinic. Maita started her journey. By going to the maid, uh, by traditional midwife, and uh, perhaps uh, the beliefs and the concept is that well, a traditional midwife could you know would be less expensive. One, uh, two, uh, could do could also do the same job or so. But uh, uh, think of a negative thought was not anything that came to their mind anyway, and they went there. Now, in this case, then um, should we give credence to? The traditional belief and the practice, or should we say, well, we need to check behind this and let something be done. 
there are there are a couple of things you know I'm just going to bring up there. I think the first one I I was you know I was opportune to to peer review a, a, a journal article from Nigeria recently for the the uh, journal that I actually write for, uh -huh. and these guys were talking about the same issue of maternal mortality and they zero in on the the uh, influence that mothers have. So usually, and this is similar in Liberian traditions as well, mm -hmm. if you live in a community and you're married to a man and his mother lives in that community mm -hmm. as well, she's had children. She's had an uh, experience of going through uh, delivering births. Yeah. So she has a huge say on where the woman is going to go when she's in labor. Yeah. So now if you go back to you know Liberian culture and look at our development as a country, roads... Hospitals didn't go into the rural parts of Liberia until maybe the 70s, you know, when, when Talbot came in and All started right. to really open up the country and places mm -hmm. that didn't have roads before started to have roads. So for a long time, the older generation have had a, a certain way of doing things, you know, and it's if you're in labor, you go to your traditional midwife and she does it. She's done it for Ma Mato. She did it for Ma Musu. She did it for Ma Kebe. Ma Kebe won 20 children. All the children there was uh, uh, were delivered by 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 by, by Omar Magnata. So obviously in their mind mm -hmm. they know her from experience. You know, from experience. Mm -hmm. And you can't shoot that down. From experience they know her to be the one that takes care of business. So obviously and you know going back to the article that I was peer reviewing, mm -hmm. what they were saying that look, we need to target the mothers, the grandmothers yeah. in these communities because they sway a lot of power when it comes to where the woman is going to go. Because like you saw in that story, yeah. she went to the midwife, the, the traditional midwife yeah. first. Mm. She didn't, she knew it was long distance to get to the clinic. If it was me, yeah, or if it was you mm -hmm. advising the family, as soon as she got into the level, say, let's go for the kin or something, start carrying her because they're distant far. But because of the tradition and the way they've done things and because of the power that grandmothers have in the community and mother-in-laws, they've already said to her, when something happened, we're carrying it to Oma Miata, Oma Miata will take care of you. When she realized that it was impossible for her to do it or when she refused to do it because according to her, Mata didn't tell her who she slept with uh, behind her husband back, that's when they decided but to take her to the place. Fidel, that's absurd. I mean, I mean, if, let me put it this way. I think um, that these traditional midwives are not somebody that are 18 or 20 years old. I, they are, you know, I mean, they should be quite older. And uh, to have that concept, to have that belief, you know, that somebody cheated on their husband, that's the reason they're having complications in giving birth. It's quite absurd, you know. I think... I said there was a couple of things, you know, that I was going to say. The second thing was not just the, the role that the mother-in-laws and, and, and mothers play. What's about, what's the second thing is access, you yeah. know. But wisdom, these people wisdom, there. What about wisdom and knowledge? Why, why didn't it play part? Well, the thing is, you have to look at, uh, you know, and this is it's difficult to do without having the empirical data in front of us. But if you look at your level of understanding, you know, we, we were fortunate, uh, I say blessed anyway, we were blessed yesterday to witness your graduation ceremony. Mm -hmm. You've gone through high school, you've gone through your first degree, now you've done your second degree. So you're at a certain level. Having had the exposure that we've had living in Europe and going to other parts of Africa, that that's not how it works. You know, you know at the end of the day, you don't know how faithful a woman or a man has been just by looking at them or because of the situations they find themselves yeah. in. You have to actually see them in the act before you can know that this man was being unfaithful or this woman was being unfaithful. You, we know because we have that uh, privilege and mm -hmm. we have that knowledge. The woman in the village been doing this thing for years. For her, when it's easy... It's because everything's fine. When it's not easy, it's because you went and, 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 and ate kasawadi when you sort of be eating tabagi. At the end of the day, that's how it is done. And because it's like that, you know, we have to break in. And going back to that article, what they were recommending is that NGOs, civil society organizations, government institutions need to target the structures in these communities when it comes to dealing with maternal health. Go and get the mother-in-laws get the grandmoms, get the mothers on board that look, when something happens, the first point of call should not be mommy other, should be a trained health worker. And that, I think, is where Liberia is still lacking behind because we need to have a strategy that targets that structure because the structure will always be there. Mm. Mother-in-law will always have that influence when it comes yeah. to pregnant women. So you have to target them. We are uh, doing a conversation here. Uh, we are macro macroscoping a story um, um, on in a front page Africa two days ago. He says it says here how traditional beliefs contribute to maternal mortality in rural Liberia. Uh, 
in a sense, the the story as well is giving um I mean credence um you know giving a pop in the back to the traditional midwives. But in another sense as well, according to the story, uh, it seems to be that something wrong somewhere and something something needs to be done. For so, well, those of you that are just joining, uh, what prompted us to uh, prompted me to bring the discussion and fight to have this wonderful uh, uh, young man in studio with me, uh, Mr. Fidel City Buddy, is this particular story. And I, I read this story with some kind of a, you know, heavy heart, especially with respect to the, uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, some of the things that were said here. For some of you that are just joining in, let me just recap um, uh, some of the paragraphs here. I said, it says here, um, according to the husband, Joseph, uh, okay, let me, let me start from the upper one. You see here, okay, the husband hired able body men to carry the wife who was pregnant in a hammock to the river banks to commence her journey into Yani, where the only clinic in the district is located, on the premises of the Pillar of Fire mission. According to the husband, Joseph Garway, Mata had been in labor two days earlier. I mean, that alone, I mean, it's not easy. Now, she was first taken to a traditional male wife in the area. But the midwife, he said, according to the husband now, could not help deliver the baby. Mata had some complications. Okay, Mata was already two days now, I mean, this labor, she can't get breath. You know, she's suffering from complications. Nobody knows what is going on. I go to the midwife now. And this is what the midwife is saying. The midwife uh, backed off the delivery. Now she decided, okay, you know, Mata been here now for a couple of a couple of hours or so. Two days she been in a in a facing uh, going through complications, but I'm backing up. Why? Because superstitiously, she accused Mata of committing adultery for which she was suffering complications and have having prolonged labor. My people, this is what this is this is this is what the story is saying. Now, uh, uh, for for uh. uh I encourage you as well. I mean, those of you that are following right now, if you want to, um, you know, make a comment that we can also read while we go, while we, uh, while we discuss this, you can also uh, uh, give your, put your comment through there. I just thought to share with you, especially for some of you that just come in, so you can also follow the trend. We begin that point by point in this particular uh, report in this story, uh, so that uh, we can just discuss the issue. Can, but, can, uh, can I just Fidel. interject? I think uh, there's a there's a comment that uh, say Albert. Jaja, Abba Jaja made a comment. I, I, I want you to read the comment because it, I think it's a very interesting comment. I'd like to actually just touch on that quickly before we get to the next question. Uh, this, uh, the, yeah, the TBA uh, uh, comment. Yeah. TBA are not outrightly traditional. I don't know, but let me just read that why he has a TBA. Mm. Uh, she is among hundreds of women in rural Liberia who sometimes die or narrowly survive delivery based on the uh, mistaken beliefs of many untrained traditional midwives, uh, TTM, and traditional birth attendants, that's the TBA he's talking about, mm -hmm. who believe labor complication is the result of adultery. Mm -hmm. The thing is, I think the point, and that, that's how I, I'm, I'm uh, sure uh, about, about... Why is he disagreeing that uh, it's not... No, th there is a confusion. I think there's con some confusions that probably need clarification. I think when hmm. we say trad, I think when he says TBA are not outrightly traditional, what I'm understanding from that is he's using the word traditional as old school. You know, like they're not old people. They're not. Uh, 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 wish. Uh, I think we do apologize. If we're using. Uh, um, uh, sorry, Albert. We can take a call now because uh, the device we're using uh, for the live broadcast is the same device that you have to call on. So. Uh, if you got your point, if you want to add more points, uh, please, uh, you can jog in, but we, we're not taking calls. Thank you. Yeah, I think what, what I was going to say is when, when we say TBA or when the, the, the actual the article refers to TBA or in, in public health or healthcare profession, when they say TBA, it don't necessarily mean a bunch of old people. You know, TBA is someone who does birth, uh, uh, who's a midwife, but use traditional methods 
So okay. it's methods right. that are not right. uh, medical. So it's not the ones that they would do in the hospital. Uh, right. So okay. it's more traditional methods. So I could be a TBA. I right. could live in a village and use traditional methods because we don't have the facility. So it's not right. saying that because it's traditional TBA don't mean that the old people that you know don't they not edu- some of them went to high school, some of them have high school I education, so. oh, yeah, but so. they use traditional methods. You know, not methods that you would use in a hospital, but methods that they use when hospitals weren't around. So that's just to clarify that. That's right, all. right. Now, uh, I mean, they, 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 let's 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 take a take a step by step. We dealt with this multi situation. Um, the situation itself is uh, very sorrowful. Mm. Uh, Mata didn't live. Uh, her mm-hmm. child in her stomach didn't survive as well uh, because of the complications. And uh, and it, now Sarah. Sarah came in to back up the story that it is happening. Uh, it is happening. It is still happening as we speak right now. That you know, mothers are our mothers are going to give birth, are going to attend to traditional midwives or to be attended to by traditional midwives or so. But then they put them in the same situation that once you have the complications, irrespective of whatever complication it is, there's no testing matter, nothing. But the conclusion would be. You cheated on your husband. Uh, this is what I said. Is, um, you know, the belief is self. I think we need to check behind it. But then, in this given scenario now, where we are, uh, Fidel, um, can we blame anybody for that? What is happening? Well, uh, you know, I started by saying that obviously the government has to take some responsibility because, you know, providing basic health care is the responsibility, the sole responsibility of the Liberian government. It has been complemented by uh, NGOs uh, in, in inside Liberia. It has also have been complemented by individual Liberians. You know, I was reading an article recently by uh, a Liberian academic, uh, Dr. Paley, uh, Rob Tell Paley, and she was looking at documenting how individual Liberians took... Uh, charge in the Ebola crisis. I mean, you know, you. She yeah. talked. She talked about you know, Honorable Sir Joseph, someone that you and I know very okay, personally, yeah, yeah. and how he started a, a campaign where he mm-hmm. uh, he himself drove ambulances around his district and collected dead bodies. Mm-hmm. She mentioned other individuals who did exactly the same. There is a lot of there's a, there's a, you know the government is not capable at this particular moment in time of meeting all of the health needs of the Liberian people. Meeting the health needs of your country and your countrymen is one way that governments have to broadcast their authority. Yeah. You know, by like you know, like you have for the NHS here, for example, the government shows that they're in charge by putting more money into the NHS, by making sure that doctors are well taken care of, that their pay is okay, and things like that. We don't have that situation in Liberia. We're way below where we need to be. The government is not able to do it. They're not capable, or maybe there's no political will. That's another discussion for another day. Mm-hmm. But they're not doing it. So what happens is you've got NGOs that are coming in to try and do okay, it. Yeah. You've got individual Liberians that are coming in to do it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, they, you know, when, you know, I think yesterday we were having a conversation. We were talking about what yeah. are NGOs doing. Yeah. This morning, preparing for the show, I sat there and I thought, I think the question should not be what are they doing. Mm-hmm. It should be how are they doing how it. How are they doing you it. You know, yeah. because any human being, yeah, mm-hmm. who sits within his domain? If you, if I, I'm in your, in, I'm in your studio now. If I walk in your studio with a with a top down attitude, with an attitude that say to you that I'm better than you, you know, like the vice chancellor was saying yesterday, yeah, don't yeah. look down on anybody, you know. But at the same time, don't look up to anybody else. If I come in and I'm looking down on you, you're going to go defensive. Yeah. And like, whoa, who are you? Yeah. Come into my domain and tell mm-hmm. me how to do things. But if I come in and say, look, Max, the way you're doing things is good. But we could change this, we could change that, and make it even better. Mm-hmm. You will look at that favorably. Mm-hmm. Then me coming in and telling, oh, what you're doing is wrong. wrong. You're not supposed to be doing it this yeah. way. And because of that, people normally fall into that defensive mode. So the question we, ask, we should be asking is, how are individual Liberians, how are NGOs, how is the government going and trying to change these things that are happening? And that, I think that is the, the, the underlying question that needs to be answered. The process. Not what they're doing because we know the money has been poured into it. Mm-hmm. We know there are a lot of NGOs in the last mile. We've got uh, Samaritan Purse, we've got Christian Aid, we've got Action Aid. There's a lot of NGOs uh, out there doing these things. But how are they doing it? Are they coming in and trying to tell the people what to do, or are they coming in and say, Look, let's have a conversation on how we can make things better? And so, that I mean, um, even though they're on the ground, uh, what I'm trying to get at here now is that they are on the ground, but um, I think there's something. 
happening there then that means uh, uh there's a kind of a land of demarcation between they and the traditional mid midwives then the thing is you, the evidence in this in this article suggests that mm -hmm. even though mm -hmm. we've had over 10 years of peace so people can't nobody can say to you nobody can say to me oh i can't go to uh, river river says county because they're fighting there no you know yeah. there's relative peace in Liberia for the past Indeed. over yeah. 10 years you mm -hmm. know so you can access Okay, yeah, the road might be bad at a certain time, but when the roads are better, you can get there. It might take you 10 days to get to a place that you should be taking 45 minutes to get there, but you still can get there without any direct threat to your life. Mm -hmm. So the possibility of people going to all parts of Liberia exist. Yeah? There are difficulties. There are challenges, like the article alluded to, mm -hmm. getting to these places. You and I have been to Liberia. You travel outside of Marova, a certain place you go and you get stuck in mud. So that's cool. We understand that. The, pros, the, pro, the, 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 the question that I said we should be asking is, mm -hmm. okay, when you do get there after 10 days, how do you approach these people? You know, like I said from the start, we can't disrespect our tradition mm. because obviously it had a significant role to play in our lives I as young people growing there. up. Yeah. I think we should always stay true to our tradition and who we are. But the fact of the matter remains that when it comes to medical things like giving birth, when it comes to making sure that children are born in a, in a conducive and, and safe environment, mm -hmm. it is the responsibility of the government of Liberia solely and primarily but then those who are there as actors to try and assist in the process need to actually look at the strategy that they're using. Because for some reason, for over 10 years, the strategy that they use is not working. It's not, because yeah. we have not evidence, mm. you know, not just one, but we have evidence from different parts of the country that shows that, look, mm -mm. If, you know, I'm so surprised that they, when they said, in Todi, my brother, it dri when I drive outside of my river, yeah. Todi is less than 30, 45 minutes away from Monrovia. Yeah. So from 35, 45 minutes away from the capital city, Monrovia, if we're having this kind of thing happening, then what about river says that car yeah. can't even get to? Mm. So it will be even worse in those places. Mm. So at the end of the day, they're doing something, but they might, uh, they're not doing it right. So they need to reevaluate the process, you know, the how. It's the how that we need to get into. Now, let, let, let's get this. Um, you know, these international, let's say, let me, let me, okay, let me, before I come to that, uh, for, I think we'll get uh, um, a statement from Abbott. Abbott, thanks for making an attempt to call. I was also apologize that. Uh, uh, we got some, um, you know, uh, technical problem. We can take your call. Uh, Abba says, yeah, thanks also, Fidel. A midwife, uh, mid midwife, field. no midwife, I think. You okay, yeah. Midwife, yeah. Okay, a midwife in training. So, like an understudy. Yeah. yeah, understudy. Under a registered nurse is also classified as a traditional birth attendant. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think uh, the TB TB uh, TV something we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's a uh, additional uh, uh, statement of uh, of uh, information and education there from uh, about about Kate Jaja, uh, our brother there at the Liberian Embassy. And now um, I was talking about these international NGOs. Um, you know, they leave from abroad. They they go. Uh, let's sense we are microscopic in Liberia, and what we're talking about. Um, who you actually is responsible to counter check what they do and to see that they are doing it the right way? I think there there are who should be. I I I think I can say I I would probably go. Uh, there might be more uh, more people, uh, but I think three. There will be three groups of individuals that I'll actually put forward. I think first of all, uh, the government of Liberia. Mm -hmm. They should be monitoring what NGOs are doing. Uh, in terms of how they're actually going out there and doing it. Mm -hmm. On that point, however, sometimes it's difficult because for those of us who've done work in international development, usually the donor tells you how to spend the money. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's kind of difficult for the Liberian government to actually tell them, oh, spend it like this or do this and do that. So that's, that's just a counterpoint. Uh, the second group will be those who are actually giving the money. So if, if you are Bill Gates or, or you are Jimmy Carter or you are a, a Clinton, uh, oh. for example, and yeah. you're pouring money into the Clinton Foundation or to the Carter Center mm -hmm. or into to some NGO in Liberia like Last Mile, then you need to be checking that the results that they're providing are factual. Yeah. Yeah. Because they will not get to everybody, as this story shows uh, or has shown. Mm -hmm. They will not get to everybody. Yeah. But the results should be not just the training of people. The impact is not how many people you train. Mm -hmm. The impact is how cultures, how ideas, how ways of thinking are changing. That's the impact. The impact will be 
going to the uh, traditional midwife and she's like, oh, this thing I ain't able to handle it. So what I can do is make you as comfortable as possible until we get you to a hospital. That for me would be seen as impact. Not the fact that we've trained 8,000. The training of 8,000 is good. You know, it's like you saying to me, oh, we bought 15 ambulances. Yeah, but if the ambulances are not going to pick people up who are in need of medical attention, there's no point so having 18 that, ambulances. So like yeah, you know, it's just 18 ambulances sitting mm-hmm. there. So the, it has to be, what are these 8,000 people achieving in terms of changing the mindsets of communities, in terms of getting uh, traditional midwives to understand that, look, they have a limitation. You know, they have a limitation in terms of the medical uh, aspects of uh, managing births. Mm-hmm. So where they know that they're short, instead of coming up with a bogus story like, oh, you cheated on your husband and why are you getting complications, take this person to a hospital. Just make them as comfortable as possible until they can get to a hospital that they can be treated at. Let's take and, it. And, and, sorry, Max, there was a third. The third group would be uh, individual librarians. Individual, the individual yeah. librarians yeah. need those in the community, those like you and I, mm-hmm. uh, like Albert and the rest of the guys, you know, who are watching today. Mm-hmm. It's our responsibility to also look, come out and ask questions like, okay, last mile you, you published a report that said this, 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 this. Okay, can you give me an example of how this one worked? Can you give me an example of how this worked? And then if they can't give an example, we need to amplify that by talking about that. Look, these guys are presenting this report as things that they've done, mm-hmm. but when we ask the questions, they can't give us examples yeah. of things. We, look, we all have a responsibility, and, and I, I, I will probably make mention to Rob Tell a few times, you know, mm-hmm. Dr. Paley, and she, she wrote a brilliant article about... Well, she does a brilliant job as about, well. So. About participative citizenship. Okay. Like, to be a citizen, yeah. it's not just holding a passport. It's not just a birth certificate. It's no. not just being born in a place. Mm-hmm. It's being active in making sure that place becomes a better place. And I think that's what we should try and aim for, become more active citizens. Right, more active citizens. Okay, we just, uh, I was uh, almost about to wrap up. Let's see, let's take a short musical break. Um, you know, this is huge misconception. I want to play a devil advocate when we come back as well. I will to what we're talking about, traditional midwives as we microscope in them. of the darkness and into the light strong are the people the future is bright we are together together we stand our children our future for women and men young and proud in west africa lucky to live in liberia Kept all right beautiful beautiful song there from our 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 friends uh friends of liberia all the way there from australia let's say uh dr Gufella and uh the rest of the guys there we say thank you so much for the beautiful song uh, Fidel, um, like I say, I mean, like, let me let me see what I can play a devil advocate there as far as this uh, microscopic um, uh, discussion is concerned. Where we're putting the, the, the traditional midwives and beliefs on a, on the microscope. Um, why, if the NGO have gone to this village, to this town, and um, requested to meet the traditional midwives, and they say maybe they want to run a workshop? training to upgrade skills and then give them information latest uh with respect to those skills uh knowledge knowledgeable information they need in order for them to do their work effectively perhaps through these uh through these trainings the the concept that we heard about matter that we heard about sarah Mm -hmm. will be erased but what if they have gone there and maybe they did a training but then they, these people have gone back and said, well, we've been do it, doing our thing like this. I mean, for many, many years. I'm 60 years old. I'm 75. I'm 80. I've been doing this since I was um, 19, 20 years old. Why, you know, why should we change it? We're going to stick to our, our beliefs and traditions. Don't you think that's also in, uh, will hinder the, the life of the people as well? Well, I think, you know, that's that's probably the most, you know, that's a very brilliant point. I think I'll, I'll just give an example to try and explain uh, how difficult it mm. is to, to, to for the NGOs and for, for ordinary librarians. I think, before I answer the question, I mm. think I've got a lot of friends in Liberia yeah. who are educated or, you know, people who have gone to, got their first degree, got their second degrees. Yeah. And these people, as educated as they are, when they get ill, they go to the pharmacy to buy medicine. Yeah. Their stomach hurting. 
they go and buy a flashy or something like that. Yeah. Their hair's hurting. They go and buy aspirin or whatever it is. And, you know, something's not working well in their body. They mm. just, as soon as they get a little fever, they say, oh, yeah, that malaria. Go and buy a malaria tablet and take it. Now, these are educated people. These are people that you'll expect to know that if something's not working, like your car, if your car is shaking and making certain sound, you take it to the mechanic. Yeah. You don't go and stop knocking things under the car no. to see what no mm. you take it to a mechanic to go and fix it you know if the uh, something on your zinc is broke you go and call a carpenter to go and fix it yeah the point i'm trying to make is when it comes to healthcare in liberia we've always been self-diagnosed we self-diagnose ourselves liberian mm. people a lot of my friends do it in liberia i complain about it all the time like when something wrong with me i consult a consultant. So even if I don't have to go and see my GP, I go online and do a quick consultation. Oh, this one wrong, this one wrong. They'll probably say, ah, oh, it might be this. And then you start to monitor. If it persists, you go and see your GP. But we normally self, you know, tend to self-diagnose ourselves. And the thing is, it's a tradition that has been there for a long time. Yeah. To get people out of it will not be one day of talking. Not two days, not three days, not one year, not five years, not ten years. It has to be a sustained, a sustained process. And using marketing, you know, we watch television here yeah. a lot, mm-hmm. and you see a market, an advert comes up, and you don't like the advert. No. But after watching that advert five, six, seven, eight times, you be stood by your kitchen doing something, pouring yourself a glass of water, and you you start to play that in your head because it's now ingrained in who you are. The point I'm trying to make is the effort has to be sustained. We cannot give up. We cannot say, oh, we went to train and now anyone use what we train go buy and train again. If they want to use it, go buy and train again. If you, the more you keep getting the message out, the more you keep telling people about the importance of this thing, the more we keep pressuring them. Look, not pressuring is probably the more we keep engaging with them to tell them, look, this thing is good for you. There will come a time when people will start to realize that there has to be a shift. And it has to be a sustained effort. It will not happen overnight, mm-hmm. you know, like NGOs. And I think that's one of the difficulties that NGOs might have if we're playing devil's advocate. Because they get funding for a year. They go and do the training for a year. Yeah. And then they have to go back. Because the funder is not giving funding. They, they turn their attention to something else. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the next time they come, they say, oh, we want to build toilets now. We don't want to do anything about uh, birth and, and things like that. So it, it's kind of difficult for them because they know that these things have not completed. But they can't go back and do it because there's no money. Because they rely on the money that the donors give them. Mm-hmm. And if the donors' priorities have changed, obviously their priority will change as well. Change as and well. that's where active citizenship comes into it. Because we have a stake in Liberia. It's our interest, or it's in our interest, to mm-hmm. see Liberia become better. Yeah. To make sure that every child that is born gets an opportunity to live past five years old. And if we want to see that, if you do it in your community on Snapper Hill. I do it in my community in Badnersville. Mm-hmm. Someone do it in your community in, in Toison or Doison or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. The little by little that we do, everyone can have an influence. Yeah. They might not listen to Maxine Pacquiao if he goes to, to, to Badnersville to go and talk about it. Mm-hmm. Because Maxine is not from Badnersville. Okay. But if I go and talk about him in Badnersville, people think, Oh, yeah, that one yeah. hour brother, yeah, you probably know what he's talking, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Similarly, if you went to Snapper Hill to talk, people will listen to you more yeah. than they'll listen to me. So the, in, the the point I'm trying to make is we can do it. We need to get involved in active citizenship by going out there and selflessly doing things to help our people. Start a little talk group in your community. Talk to women about the importance of seeking professional uh, care when it comes to this kind of thing. And that's sustained effort. That all of us can play, complementing the government, complementing NGOs, mm-hmm. we can then take it to another level. No, another level. But um, I mean, finally, uh, just before we end on this topic, um, um, Fidel, I mean, uh, it's, it's an honor to have you on your have you on live as well, um, discussing this particular all important uh, aspect, something that, ha- that is attached to us and um, any librarian for that matter who who think that. Um, you know, what we're talking about is vital to talk about, especially the points that you're making here. Um, um, it's quite important. Uh, if we know the sense of, our sense of responsibility to our community, to ourselves and our country, then we know how to give back to the community as well. Uh, uh, we know that, you know, many of us, we know that definitely we, uh, especially for librarians, we always say that we are good at talking instead of putting it in action as well. But, uh, where we are now, um, I, I want to uh, wrap on this uh, in terms of uh, advancing, you know, your, 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 not only your thought, but your advice, pieces of advice uh, to those in NGOs. Some of them 
I can tell you right now, some of them are following us right here now as we speak, especially that have, that, that have got interest in what we're talking about and it, they're on the ground, they're doing it right now. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, well, perhaps st the story that we have, uh, we, we, have uh, we have chosen and the, the story in there, in depth that we read it, uh, perhaps they haven't come across it and they don't even know whether, well, traditional midwives or you know, where these people exist or so. Perhaps they have not even been outside of Monrovia or so, just in most of other country. I mean, generally, what sort of advice do you think you will, you will give to them as we read the story, we discuss this issue, and they are on the ground to do similar work? What sort of advice will you be advancing to them? I think one, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is about uh, stakeholder ownership. I think when you go into a community... Uh, when you go to do a certain piece of job yeah. that you believe will make the community better, it's very important that the people that you're trying to improve buy into the idea that they're going to be improved. If you are writing a project proposal, there has to be something in there that evaluates, honestly evaluates, mm -hmm. the, the, the impact you know that you're having on the community yeah. and the impact will be if you went into a community and tried to get people to understand that your first point of call should be the hospital if you can get there and not the traditional midwife the traditional midwife should be a last point of call so if you cannot get to the hospital in time then yes go and see the traditional midwife to kind of get you in a stable position until you get to the hospital. If that is the point that you know, not point. If that's the the impact that you want to make, then you should be able to test that. You know, when people are giving birth in the community, when people are in labor, where do they go first? If after you've done the training or after you've gone in and talked to the people, and you still see a huge number of people still going to the traditional midwife first, mm -hmm. as soon as they get into labor, instead of trying to get to the hospital first, then you need to try and understand what are the other implications. Is it because, for example, in Mata's case, you had to go get on Kino and then cross the river and then walk for 45 minutes? Is it because of the distance or is it just because in their mind they feel that traditional midwives should be the first point of call. So, but you have to test the impact of it. You can't just say, oh, look, this is what we did. We train people. They will now go out and do the job. No, you have to go back. And, and it comes back to the funding situation. Do they have the funding to go back in and test that these things are actually okay. working? Yeah. You know, and where they can't do it, engaging with individuals in the community, say, look, can you keep an eye out? Can you give us information when these things happening. When the Musu that's pregnant, we've got six people women pregnant now. Keep your eye on them. When they get pregnant, and when they're about to deliver, when they get into labor, where do they go first? Are they going to the clinic or are they going to the matter? If they go in, then you know that there's no impact. Then you have to go back. So whatever, you know, it's not always easy because of the funding mm -hmm. for the NGOs themselves to go back. But it's always good, like, for us who are researchers, when we go into community to do research, we yeah. create that link. That five, six, seven years from now, you still have someone that you can call like, yeah. oh, has things changed? Or are things like this now? Or is it better? You need NGOs to start to adapt that kind of mentality. But when you go in, don't just go do and disappear. Mm -hmm. Go do, make connections that you can then refer to those connections so that they can give you an assessment of the impact of the project. Fidel, means an honor, man. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful, brilliant, brilliant, uh, you know, talk discussion as well, your contribution this afternoon, this morning, depending from where you're listening or watching the live broadcast from. We, I want to say thank you, Fidel. Thank you and, um, um, it's an honor to have, to have you here, especially in, in live in studio um, and uh, discussing uh, issues uh, relative to Mama Liberia. But uh, just before final thought, um, just in case, um, what, you have anything final to, talk, to tell your people as well, especially those that are listening? Well, I think, you know, for me, the one thing I'll keep zeroing on is the fact that we need to become active citizens. Uh, you know, I'm 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 I'm, I'm glad that uh, mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Akwe Bazi is actually watching oh, yeah, from Sheffield yeah. because he's he's an example of an active citizen. I also see the, uh, um, the president of the Labrina Association in Holland as well. Okay, yeah, you know, uh, Pastor Bazi is an is an example of an active citizen. He, he has been working along with Liberian organizations here to do things for 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 Liberians here and Liberians in Liberia as well. We have a responsibility. We can put the blame on the government because, yes, it's their responsibility to make sure that the social fabrics of our societies function yeah. in the right way, that it serves the interests of all Liberians. It's their responsibility, number yeah. one. That's mm -hmm. why we have a government. Yeah. And two, the, 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 the NGO sector has 
to come in and compliment the government in terms of what they do. But I think going back to the uh, article that I said that Rob Tell wrote recently and talked about active citizenship in terms of how it worked during the Ebola with Honorable Sir Joseph and other individuals. I can't remember their names. Mm -hmm. And some of us here, we did our marches here. We yeah. raised money for, yeah. for the Ebola. Pastor Bazi was part of that as well. We need to, as Liberians, get into a new mind frame. And that will be my main message to the look. We need to have a passion. The Vice Chancellor mentioned yeah. that yesterday. Yeah. Have a passion. Ask yourself the question, who am I? What do I believe in? What is it in this world that I want to change? What is it in Liberia? Let's not go to the world. We're yeah. talking about Liberia. Liberia. What is it in Liberia that I want to change? I want to change do yeah. I want to see every woman who goes to lab who goes into labor have a safe birth? Yeah. Do I want to see that? If that's what you want to see, that's what you need to be passionate about. That's what you need to get involved in. Start in your community. You don't have to start big. No. You don't have to be an NGO. Start in your community. 50 pounds can print out flyers. Mm -hmm. You put it in low school buildings or in on the walls in low clinics around there. You go home to visit your family. You talk to the women in the community. Look, when these things happen, where do you go? Engage with the traditional yeah. birth attendant. Okay, if women are having complications, what does that mean to you? And try to, on your own, break that circle of people thinking that, oh, if somebody's uh, having complications, it's because she cheated on her yeah, husband or husband. cheated on him. Yeah. We, you know, we, we can sit here and we can condemn it if we want to, but I don't think that's the way. The way is to go and engage with these people, try and understand why they're thinking that way. But if we become active citizens, you know, where we're not just saying that I'm a Liberian, yeah. you are doing Liberian, you know, I think that that's, that's the, yeah, you need to do Liberian, yeah. do Liberian, be a Liberian that goes in and make a change in your community. And imagine if every, if you get a group of 100 Liberians from across the spectrum of the Republic going into their communities and finding one issue, forget about the government, forget about the NGO, and spending their time, every time you go home for that one month or for that three weeks, this is the thing I want to do. When you're here, you're collecting, you're putting things together because of that one thing, it will change. Because your whole life is to change that thing. That's and that's all you're going to work on. And if you change in your community, I change something in my community, you change something in your community, everybody, my brother, will get Liberia to a state where, I'm not saying that the government should not take its responsibility, you know, but we need to help complement. Because we know Liberia is one of the poorest countries in the world. Yeah. Not because we don't have the resources, but because of the mismanagement. mismanagement. However, we need to start to do things to help people. We can't keep waiting. Keep chastising the government to make sure that they become more effective mm -hmm. and efficient. But at the same time, uh, what we say, dry door sweet. Uh, what about yeah. we eating for the dog and dry? Let dry. me do something for the people while we're working while on the we're government. Working on government. Government. Indeed, that's Mr. Fidel Budi, yes, he's the, also the Secretary General of the you know, Liberian Organizations in the United Kingdom. Um, also, right now, uh, Mr. Budi is also, um, uh, you know, taking, doing his courses, uh, a doctorate degree uh, courses uh, as well. And soon, soon, uh, soon, we'll be uh, celebrating, celebrating that as well. And, um, of course, Liberia uh, will be um, benefiting from this young man, especially with respect to what he, what he's, what he's doing and what he's about to achieve as well. Community empowerment, starting from where the people are and what they have. That's um, Pastor Akwe Bazi there, all the way there from uh, Sheffield, England, uh, uh, contributing on the show. But for now, uh, on this topic especially. Um, Microscoping the story uh, in the front page Africa two days ago, which says how traditional beliefs contribute to maternal mortality in rural Liberia. There are a whole lot of things that were mentioned in this story. Uh, people dying, uh, went to give birth and they died uh, because the traditional male wife said that because they cheated on their husband, that's what caused them to die. Or yeah, that that what caused them to have complications. But on this note, for right now, for now, we say thank you so much for listening. Thank you for following. Thank you for sharing the video. Thank you for liking the video, and we thank you for your attention as well. Fidel, say bye to your people as well. Thank you very much, Max. I want to say thank you to everyone for participating, and I hope we can use this opportunity to start uh, our individual campaigns of making change in Liberia. Indeed. Thank you, and goodbye for now.